Well, I want to start with this question, and then we're going to circle back to Moses. Any Christian would be fair game to ask this question. Am I truly a representative of God? Like, am I representing God? I, I don't know. That's something to think about. We, we probably instinct, instinctively want to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to. Like, that, that's, my, that's my hope. But I think it's something that is worth digging into. Um, am I truly a representative of God? Well, we're going to look at Moses today. Now, when you think about Moses, what's the first thing that pops into your head? You can, you can shout out. It's okay. What's the first thing that pops into your head when you think about Moses from the Old Testament? What? Wandering in the desert. That's good. Did you say something? I thought I heard some. Parting the seas. Uh, what about the tablets? Yeah, Ten Commandments, right? Like that, that. So, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, we can. This Moses, like, I just want y'all to understand. Like, I want to preach all of Moses. If you have any idea how much of Exodus that is, and there's like three distinct movements to Moses's life, so it's like there's a lot there, right? But I think for some of us, I know I'll just I'll just give you my story. If you would have asked me this a long time ago before digging into this and preparing this message, I might have first thought of Moses as like the lawgiver. Like as he went up on the mountain and and God gave him the 10 commandments, which like that's that's significant, right? And and Moses was a was a key part of that story. And that's true, but what I want to help frame today as we've been doing when we go through this series is we're looking at these are folks that are part of our kingdom family like these are folks and so we're looking at folks in the context of their relationship to God and Moses is a person that had like a close intimate personal friendship with God and that and that made a difference right it wasn't just like Moses didn't just like have a good prayer life now it's it's good to have a good prayer life, but like it went beyond that. Like Moses' relationship with Jesus was not only intimate; I would say it was intense. Like there, you couldn't really separate that from who he was. It just like he was, if I could phrase it this way, like he was a God person. Now, not in a way that we need to put him up on a pedestal, right? Because we're looking at these different uh, you know, family members of ours in the kingdom, and. We're not putting them upon a pedestal because we're looking at how can we uh, model after them? How can we step into the reality of some of what they represented? So think about this with me. The testimony about God from a true representative should show us how God really is. Right? Like if, if... we see a testimony lived out that's a true representation. That's going to show us how God really is. Well, we know the only perfect version of that is Jesus. Like Jesus is the perfect reflection of the Father. Jesus is the one we model our lives after. He is like the true testimony, the true representation. He even says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And and it's our position here that. Jesus, as a witness, gives us, I want to phrase it this way, the undiluted truth about Jesus. When we're thinking about us and are we a true representative of Jesus, I would say most of us are, but is it maybe at times like diluted? Because maybe we sometimes have some narratives about God that maybe aren't quite right. Like maybe we've had some beliefs that don't exactly line up. And that, that's okay. Like we, we all have that. You know, none of us have our, our beliefs and our theology perfect. But what we present to the world as a representative of God it is probably not like perfect. Right? So I just, but I just like to think of it as like it's diluted. It's not like fundamentally changed. But Jesus represents the undiluted, like perfect picture of Jesus. And if we care about the truth 
of God's testimony, we should care about that more than like our rep, right? Like I, I, if I'm considering, am I a true representation of God's heart? I want to be more concerned about that than like how I look or what people think of me for becoming that representation. Our experience of God like working in our lives, how many of you have God like working in your life at some level, right? The experience of that is directly related to our understanding. The the biblical word might be like our revelation of his love for us. Like, our narrative of what we believe about God. Like, do we really believe that he's good all the time, regardless of what's happening? Like, what we really, and I'm not talking about what we say we believe, because you can say you believe one thing, but if the way you live your life contradicts it, there, there might be some dilution, there might be some tension somewhere in, in your heart. If we really fully understand, and none of us do perfectly, Jesus' love for you, the way he looks at you and who he really is, we would, we would be in a really good place. Moving towards that understanding has the power to change us all. Okay? Now, I, I just want to jump to the New Testament, make a quick comment, and then we're going to go back and get to Moses. The reality of this conflict between God being who he says he is, like being accurate, true representation, Jesus claiming to be God, was like the source of all the conflict we see in the New Testament between Jesus and all the religious leaders of the day. They were looking in terms of, but this is what the rule book says, and Jesus is saying, I've come to fulfill the rule. Like, I'm, I've come to do something different. I am from God. They had a picture of the Father that differed from what Jesus was showing. Does that make sense? The religious leaders of the day had a picture of God as Father that differed from what Jesus was showing, and so they began to question his testimony. All right, so back to Moses. Do we see Moses as the lawgiver? Or do we see Moses as a person who was a participant with God? And and we're not going to go deep into the story. I'll give you some places to read if you want to dig into it more. But Moses was a participant with God in in some of the most powerful displays of God's power, like pre-cross of Jesus. Like, he's, he's not an insignificant character in the story. And as I already said, he had uh, this fully integrated relationship with God fully integrated, like it wasn't just like something he tacked on. Do you realize that that's actually our goal? Not just out of Sunday morning, but like our our big picture goal is that we want to, for ourselves and for those in our community, like we want to move towards a fully integrated life with God. And that doesn't mean you have to become somebody different, right? Like you can be who you are, but we want a fully integrated life with God means I'm not just with God when I come here on Sunday morning. I have this integrated relationship so that whatever context I'm in, I can be with God, I can be a participant with Him, and I can also still fully be myself. God doesn't need you to show up as somebody that has things just all cleaned up on the outside. Like, He doesn't need you to show up and pretend. This is a little countercultural, but my hope uh, for us as a community is that we would model that, that we don't expect folks that come into the community to be all cleaned up or to pretend that they've got it all together because hopefully we can model vulnerability and honesty in saying, we don't have it all together. We don't have it all figured out. And it actually like opens the door of receptivity to say, 
but we're just on a journey together. We're on a journey together trying to figure out what it is to live the Jesus way, being authentic, being real, but also being supernatural in whatever context Jesus has put us in. So Moses was that kind of person. And I want to look at that. We're going to go to Exodus 34. Uh, If you've got a paper Bible or a Bible device, you can jump there. We're not going to read a lot, uh, because as you know, if I read big chunks, then I I have to talk too much. And we're not going to have time to dive into everything. But let me give you just a little bit of a, a, a synopsis of the story. So Moses and the Israelites have been uh, on a traveling journey. And at one point, uh, basically Moses goes up on the mountain to be with the Lord. And this is, this is where he gets the Ten Commandments, the, the story that we referenced earlier. Meanwhile, as Moses is up on the mountain with the Lord, the people are like, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. We don't know if he's coming back. We're kind of getting tired of waiting. We want a God to lead us. So they start basically prodding and poking Aaron. Well, make us a God. Make us something to lead us. And they end up, they melt down all the gold. If you know the story, they make the golden calf to worship, you know. And so all of this transpires. And then Moses is coming back down the mountain, having spent time with God. He's got the tablet. And then he's like, what in the world? And I like to call him Mo. Mo gets like angry. Like, because he's like, what in the world? Like, I haven't really been gone that long, and you guys have just like made a whole new God, and you're just like totally off the program. And and he was angry. And I would take that a step further and say, I think God was, I would probably use the word disgusted. Like, because his people who he had led and cared for and whatever, like they just they completely lost the program. They're like, no, we're we're gonna do this other thing. So it turns out. That Moses says, I, 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 I'm going to go spend some more time with God. I'm going to go back up on the mountain. Uh, uh, and, and how many of you can relate? Like, sometimes I just need to withdraw from that tense situation and go be with Jesus so he can set me right again. Right? So, like, I can attack my problems in a healthier way. Well, he goes back up on the mountain, and this is where we're going to pick up. This is uh, Exodus 34. Verse 28, Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread and drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. Now, I, I just want to pause here. It, it, even right there, we've already seen a miracle. I don't know if you know this, you probably do most humans can't survive 40 days with no water. Like God, but I I, I just, Moses had a relationship. He had cultivated this space with God where God could literally sustain him. So he spent this time, but he's he's doing this because he's just like, like all of us, he probably doesn't know what to do next, right? Like, so he, and, and this, this is a great thing for us to do. When you don't know what to do, spend time in intimate worship with God. And I'm not saying that that's like a magic formula that you're always going to get like the instant, you know, cookie cutter answer to your problem, but you're never going to regret it. Sometimes God's going to give you the answer. Sometimes you're just going to adjust your perspective. But Moses had a relationship where when he got stuck, he went back and spent time with God. I think we would do well to remember that. The first thing that I want to draw out of this story, and we're going to look at another couple of verses here in a little bit, is that relationship is a long-term development. What Moses experienced on the mountain with the Lord, where he got this revelation that turned into the Ten Commandments, which I, you know, it's like a significant thing for us as Christians was not the result of like bumping into God on a whim. He had cultivated and developed a long-term relationship with God. Now, 
You think, oh, that makes it. No, that should encourage you that wherever you're at right now in your spiritual journey, you don't have to have arrived. You can continue to cultivate, and God will use you to do things through you wherever you're at on that journey. But we always can be moving forward. We always can be cultivating a long-term relationship with Jesus. I've, I've used this phrase before, but we need to be careful in our relationship with God that we don't get so hung up on visiting with God, whether that means like I don't think about him till I come to church or I wait till I'm in trouble and need help. We don't need to just visit with God when we bump into things. We need to habitate with God. Like we need to live with him 24-7. We need to be aware of his presence and cultivate that long-term relationship. I want to flip over and do do a a New Testament uh, connection to this. If you flip over to to Romans 7, Romans 7, verse 4, this is out of the New Living Translation. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law, because remember Moses was in a covenant time where he was, it was about the law. When you died with Christ, you died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead, which of course is Jesus. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Did you notice that phrase, as a result? We could sort of like reverse engineer this. Basically, all the things we think we, all the things that we do that we think are pretty good don't really mean a whole lot if it's apart from Jesus. The point of of the Christian life is not to just do good things. It's actually to die and become a different kind of person. A person that is centered in and modeled after Jesus. And as a result, see, I wasn't going to go here, but we get it backwards. I'm not necessarily saying we here in the room, but just like toxic American Christianity. We think if we believe enough right things, and if we do enough good deeds, if we serve people, then like that's going to bring us life. I've, I've got like disappointing news for folks that still think that way. The only place to find life is in the voice of Jesus. Like, and you can do all the things, and, and we're about, like, our faith should cause us to do things. Like, in the olden days, they used to say, you know, if, to be a vineyard, like, if you're not going to serve the poor, don't put vineyard on the door. Like, we care about that. that. That's important, that we actually put our faith into action. But we don't do things to get something. It is produced in us as a fruit or a result of having this intimate relationship with Jesus where we've died to us, where we've like laid down our rights and our reputation. Did you realize that your legacy, like what, what you accomplish in this world and what you're about is tied to God's reputation to the people around you? That's a sobering thought. But in the context of relationship, God can bear that fruit. Like, we can see a harvest of good deeds. Again, and I'm not talking about, like, becoming a weirdo. I'm not saying that we all need to become, like, you know, soapbox street corner preachers or, like, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we can live our lives in such a way that the Spirit produces good works with pure motive that we serve people just because we see the value in them as humans created by God. Not to serve a program, not to grow our church, but because we recognize we are just as broken and messed up, maybe in different ways, but I have no room to judge. I am here to serve people because God through me wants to serve people. He wants to reach those people with his love. Like whatever measure of goodness I have experienced as a result of having a relationship with Jesus, I want if I care about people, I want other people in my life to like to get a hold of that, to taste that, to experience it. 
But as we said a couple of weeks ago, God works through people. I mean, he's sovereign. He can do stuff and he does crazy stuff. But his primary mode and method is to serve and reach people through us. Okay, I already touched on that connection between your legacy and God's reputation with people. Uh, I want to look at one more New Testament reference for this last point. Romans 3, 21. This is going to be out of the message version. But Romans 3, 21. In our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all of those years has happened. So see, if we go back to the Old Testament context, they're looking forward to something. We've seen it now happen. Okay, so that's, that's the context. The God setting things right, that's just like a, a, a way of uh, translating that, that phrase. God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. In other words, what we've read about in the stories has become a reality for us now. So that's what makes it not just a story. It, it's a now thing. You jump down to verse 24. It says, out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. See, this is another one of those Christianese words. And the words themselves are not bad, but often if we don't have clear meaning, we, we don't quite get the power of it. This is what redemption is all about. God has taken what was and brought it into something new by means of Jesus. Like, what I was before I met Jesus was not good. I mean, I, and everybody's story in that is different. You might think you were pretty good. Like, I mean, Oh, I didn't do, you know, like the worst things that somebody could do. Or maybe that is part of your story. Regardless, what I was, who I was before Jesus has been redeemed. And that doesn't just mean like changed and tweaked a little bit. It means taken back to like the original intent. And, and I'm still in that process. You all are. Like that's not like a, an instant thing that just happens in one moment. But God is redeeming us. He, he's, he's taking us from where we were and restoring us to what he designed us for. Did you know when Jesus looks at you, he sees you in your full potential? Like he, he, not just like he thinks about it and believes it, but like I think because he sees outside of time and space, he's like, he, he knows what your life can lead to. He knows how good it can be. And his job by his Holy Spirit is to help move you in that direction. To help redeem you for what you were made for. And, and in the one sense, you know, we're all made for God, but there's a specific way that you were created and wired to have a positive effect. And I don't just mean that in a general sense. I mean like a God different on this world. There's a unique way that you can partner with him to see not only your life changed, but to like put your fingerprints with God on the redemption of the world. To actually see things move in the right direction. And if you, you know, if you scroll through X and read the, the news headlines, it probably doesn't feel like things are going that direction. But I want to encourage you not to be like led by that. God is redeeming the world. He is moving in a direction of redemption. And my question to us as we get ready to wrap up this message looking at Moses is how do we, as the people of God, create redemptive possibilities for the people around us? That's, that's a big question, and I'm not going to fully answer that for you here this morning. But I think that's a question worth wrestling with. How can we create redemptive possibilities? And see, all, all, all I'm saying is that we need to create the opportunities. See, God, God does the redemptive work. Like, that's not on, it's not on me to redeem you or to redeem my neighbor. 
but I can be a part of creating those opportunities. And you want to know one of the best ways to do that? Uh, I'm going to introduce a, a phrase called relational evangelism. Now, I'm, I'm just going to give you like a short, we, we can dive into it more later, but most people, when they think of evangelism, when they think of sharing their faith, it uh, could be called like initial point of contact. Like I meet someone and my purpose is to immediately tell them about Jesus and I'm probably never going to see them again. And I'm not saying that, that, that that's like thrown out, that you like you never do that. But some people's whole concept that's not very people-centric, right? Relational evangelism says, I, as an agent of redemption, as a representative of Jesus, am going to engage in relationship with people, not to see them as souls to win, but because I see them as valuable humans created in the image of God, and I'm just going to create relationship with them. And yeah, over time, that might create opportunities. For, conver- for God conversations, for questions, you know. But what I'm saying is I want to show up in that relationship just as my authentic, spirit-filled, Jesus-following self and trust God's redemptive process to be worked out rather than trying to guilt-trip people with, uh, you know, bashing them over the head with uh, Scripture when I don't know them. Like, do you understand how much it makes a difference to have like a heart-to-heart, you know, converse, God conversation or life conversation with someone that I've cultivated a, a relationship and a level of trust with versus the random person I meet on the street that I mean. Now again, God will sometimes lead you to do that. Uh, that that's fine. That's that's in bounds. But I'm saying the primary thing is that we need to get better at developing relationships with people so that we create safe spaces for people to ask God questions, for, for people to have those opportunities. And, and I know that I've just like opened a whole can of worms, All right, Okay, how do we work that out? What does that look like? Well, that's something I think we need to explore. But it's one of the best ways, I think, for us that we can begin to create those redemptive possibilities. And, and we can take... the. Can any of you, like, maybe you've had this desire. Uh, I would love to be a part of someone else's God story. But if you're like me, can you just, like, breathe a a sigh of relief that that doesn't mean you have to be responsible for the results? Just like, oh. Because sometimes we can carry that. Be like, I can't engage with sharing my faith because I don't think I'm good at it. I don't know. I didn't go to Bible. You know you have, we have all these reasons. It's like, what if you don't have to be responsible for the results? What if your primary job was just to cultivate a life with Jesus where he's always present, where he's just like part of you, and engage in intentional relationships with people and trust his spirit to work that process and be ready when the opportunity comes, when that person that you've cultivated a relationship with comes with a God question, be ready. Like, in an authentic, honest, and gentle way to just engage with that conversation. Not to give them all the answers, but to engage in that conversation in a supportive way. I think we would be surprised at the results we might see if we began to shift our thinking and our living in that direction.